Well, Mayor Allegood, we've been looking forward to interviewing you for this project, and uh, you're so much a part of the, the recent history of Ackworth. Uh, and wanted to start uh, asking you about your background. Uh, I know you were raised in Atlanta. Uh, I'm assuming you were born sometime in the early 50s. 1950. 1950 yeah. on the dot. Okay. Right on the money. All right. And um, grew up in Atlanta then at a time when Atlanta was beginning to boom. You know, not that it hadn't been booming before, but it, all, Georgia seemed to take off after World War II. But uh, also a time of great tension as well in the city and with um, civil rights and what have you when you would have been growing up there. What, um, did you go through the integration process in the schools in, in Atlanta? You know, that is a, a great question. It there was there was an awareness. I grew up in Sandy Springs, which oh, okay. uh, in 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 Atlanta on the north side of town, we were we we were not a very diverse community. Mm-hmm. And so the the schools that I went to, grammar school and uh, high school, basically by the time I got to high school, it was it was integrated. Mm-hmm. And but because of the demographics of our community, we were not uh, very diverse. So we didn't have um, a, a very diverse population. And it was not until actually I went away to college that I began to realize the diversity. And um, uh, but growing up. In Sandy Springs was a, a great experience, um, and it was a it was a community that that did not did not have uh, experience a lot of tension from the civil rights time, and it was uh, a community that that had, you know, that was a, a loving, caring community. Mm-hmm. Why Gordon Military College? Gordon Military College was a decision made by my parents as I was uh, finishing up high school that. Um, uh, they felt like that I needed probably some real good study disciplines. And uh, uh, also, uh, another really important factor, in 1968, the, the Vietnam War was, was really uh, heating up, and a lot of uh, my friends were going to Vietnam. My dad thought that being in, uh, in a military school would give me an opportunity through the ROTC program that if I did uh, wind up being drafted, mm-hmm. that it would um, put me in a position to, uh, to through the ROTC mm-hmm. program, with certain benefits that would help me with, uh, with uh, leadership uh, in the United States services. Right. Did you continue ROTC when you went to Georgia? No, I did not. As soon as I got out, I went through, uh, while I was at Gordon Military College, I was, uh, 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 the lottery was in effect. I went through one year of lottery. I was active. I had an active number for the draft. I missed the draft. Uh, and went on to University of Georgia, and I left the ROTC program behind. Mm-hmm. But I bet you learned some leadership skills. I learned some ROTC great leadership program. skills, and uh, uh, at the time, some great study skills, personal discipline skills, that without that military influence in my life, and those two years at Gordon Military College in Barnesville, Georgia, uh, my path, my journey could have been much different. What did you major in at Georgia? I majored in psychology. I got to University of Georgia. I was always interested in behavior, human behavior, communicating with mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And so it was a, kind of a natural for me to look to, to, to study psychology and the understanding of, of, of human behavior. But probably the most important overriding uh, thing that I learned, skill set, was about communication, being a good communicator, and how you take leadership skills and communicate with those. I cannot imagine you with long hair. Did you have long hair back then? I did. uh, When I showed up in Barnesville, Georgia in 1968, September 1st, 1968, I had hair that was right down to my shoulder. And and, and then they, they lined us all up out there in front of the barracks put us on a bus, took us to downtown Barnesville, and they cut our hair off. In fact, they cut it off so short that it was like, I remember I remember going in the bathroom and, and really tears coming to my eyes because it was such a, a strange sight. <laughs> yep. Uh, did it get long again when you got to the University of Georgia? No. Uh, at that point, uh, there were a lot of things socially that were going on uh, that that were happening, we 
were undergoing a lot of social changes in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. But when I went to University of Georgia, I wound up in a fraternity at the Kappa Sig house. So the Kappa Sig group, uh, the fraternity, was kind of a conservative group. So I was mm -hmm. making the... The military mm -hmm. was a very abrupt transition for me, mm -hmm. and I basically continued that same trend uh, on a conservative, uh, leaving kind of some liberal ideas that I might have had in high school and, and rethinking mm -hmm. things socially uh, from a conservative standpoint. Well, I guess your uh, fraternity uh, uh, gave you uh, a, a brotherhood that protected you from the larger society because I know what was going on at the University of Georgia in the early 70s. Well, it was, and there were a lot of demonstrations on campus. We, our fraternity house was over on River Road. We were a bit, uh, a little bit protected there, if you would, but there were uh, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of things that were going on socially um, during that time. Very traumatic time for young people. But well, I was wondering whether you were SDS or Young Americans for Freedom, and maybe you weren't anything, but I'm not sure, but I think you pretty well answered my question. Yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, Young Americans for having a great time. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so you, you got your degree in psychology? Correct. And then uh, went into the business world. Uh, I was I managed uh, it, I managed the Lowe's stores in Atlanta in 1972. When I went to work for Lowe's, there were three Lowe's stores: mm -hmm. one in College Park, one in Smyrna, and one in Norcross. Just three. Just three stores, and their their business model then was uh, we sold building supplies directly to builders. Okay. So there was not the retail store that you see today. It was uh, it was a a very high volume uh, builder environment where they were dealing with builders. And um, I, at one point, managed all of the Lowe's stores here in Atlanta. Okay. Worked for Lowe's for 14 years. It was a great uh, experience, taught me, uh, allowed me to use my leadership skills, and taught me really, um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of began a, a trajectory of a builder, of being a builder, understanding builders, and what it was like to build organizations mm -hmm. and to really be able You're to have... That metaphorically as well as literally. I'm using it metaphorically as, as well as literally and, mm -hmm. and really began to, uh, uh, to teach me uh, the leadership skills about building consensus and how you get people to do what you want them to do for the benefit of, of an organization mm -hmm. and for their own Mm -hmm. Personal benefit. Yeah. Well, so fourteen years, and then why did you leave Lowe's? What kind um, of I had the opportunity to start to go into business for myself. So I actually uh, have always had this entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. uh, and so we, uh, I, I had a partner. We started a building supply, mm -hmm. uh, and then for the next many many years, I was uh, in the building supply and building business. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those. Uh, the, all of those lines kind of cross one another from selling building supplies to actually building homes, rebuilding homes. I've, they all have been uh, an important part of what Where I've done. Where were you building the homes? Uh, in 1990, periodically, uh, off and on, I was building homes, some homes in Cobb County. In 1992, when I, after Hurricane Andrew, I bought some homes in South Florida, rebuilt those. I was in the building supply business. Okay. But then, since we've been here in Atlanta, we've, or, I'm sorry, since we've been here in Ackworth, we've built probably, um, probably about uh, 80 homes here in Ackworth. Wow. And in the past 20 years. So you're still doing that? Then? Yes, building right now, have a home under construction right now. Well, I guess it wasn't um, uh, a total novelty for you to buy a historic home in Ackworth. Then. No. No, actually, uh, in 1997, when we we were we had we were transitioning from South Florida after Hurricane Andrew, and I came here to help a friend of mine that owned a building supply, Acme Building Supply here, mm -hmm. and he asked me to come and help him. And while I was up one week working, I found the old uh, McMillan House where mm -hmm. we live today, mm -hmm. and it was that old historic home and the 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 charm mm -hmm. of that home. And the challenge of the renovation that brought us here to Ackworth, Georgia. I, I saw this home. I could saw the potential. I was already helping Lloyd uh, at Acme Building Supply and his son, Denny. Mm -hmm. And we bought the home and began to restore it. I really thought that we would buy the home, restore it, sell it, and uh, that we might not be here but for a year, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
now you know the rest of the story. We've been here 22 years. Well, so. I think I remember seeing that house before it was renovated, and it was a challenge. Yeah, anyway. my dad said that it looked like the Munsters' house. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I bet you, but you already had the experience, so you knew. Yeah, we, we through the years uh, from building and repairing uh, homes, uh, had um, a lot of experience. I, we had been, uh, we had had the opportunity after Hurricane Andrew, uh, the building supply part, to renovate. We worked for, we were the state contractor for the Resolution Trust Corporation, mm -hmm. and we repaired about 300 homes uh, in all around Florida for the RTC. Uh -huh. So I had a pretty high confidence level of being able to fix things, repair things. I knew what it took. And when we moved here, um, the, the the home, I loved it so much. The, the, the renovation didn't scare us. Yeah. Well, tell me how you met Carol and what she thought about living in a house under construction. You know, that's a, that's a really uh, important intersection in my life. I meet Carol in 1993, right after Hurricane Andrew. I had gone to South Florida. I had a, a best friend. We were in the building supply business. We went to South Florida to sell building materials to help rebuild South Florida uh, and located uh, a, con a construction lot right in the middle of downtown Key Largo. And where I was staying, I was I, I found a place to stay at the Rock Harbor Club. And Carol lived at the Rock Harbor Club. She she had been widowed, uh, had two children, and she had been widowed. And um, so we meet and we get married, and uh, we live in Key Largo until uh, basically 1997. So we had a a great time. We we had a sailboat. We sailed every day, and then we come back here to Ackworth, Georgia. It's the old McMillan house that brings us back, and. Um, the way we did that is we began the renovation and we brought some crews from South Florida up. They do the work. Mm -hmm. And it took about 30 days before we could even move in. Then we moved in, continued to do the work while we lived there. And that was a real trick. But Carol's such a, 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 a flexible person. It was really easy. No, mm -hmm. Nobody else would have wanted to do that adventure except Carol. And uh, we. it was a really... Uh, a really great well, experience. She has an interest in the arts, and I guess that fit with preservation, didn't it? Yes, it is. It is. She is very interested as being an artist, and she knew the importance of the preservation of the old McMillan House, um, and that that preservation, that the beginning of that journey for us, that brings us uh, to Ackworth, Georgia. That that's a life changing intersection for us, Carol, for me. And then coming to and buying the old McMillan house and making a decision to preserve that home mm -hmm. uh, was uh, was a, a, a life changing intersection for us. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Well, um, so you so you did that, and uh, fortunately you you could bring a crew up to do some of the work for you. Yes, we brought folks up from South Florida, and they worked, and uh, uh, they they actually came back and forth a couple of times, but. Um, there was a lot to do on the house when we when we when we bought the old McMillan house. Uh, the plumbing didn't work. Uh, there there were no bathrooms that worked in the house, and we tore out walls, moved walls around, had to get uh, uh, the the bathrooms working again. All the plumbing, new electrical, new plumbing. It was uh, it was a uh, a very uh, extensive uh, renovation. How old was the electrical in the house? Well, it was probably forty or fifty years old. It's probably it was probably the third generation, maybe no, probably the second generation of electrical. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the beginning, um, in the beginning, it might not have had electrical in the beginning. It has old plaster walls. It had fireplaces that had coal, so uh, most likely might not have had because uh, the house was built in nineteen hundred. Might not have had electrical. Good chance in nineteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what was your impression of Ackworth when you came here in 97? Well, I can remember uh, that morning that I was up uh, visiting, and I had stayed over. I'd, I'd flown up, worked with Acme all week long, and on Saturday morning, um, Carol had flown up. I said, I want you to come up. I found this old house, and we walked downtown we walk to the street downtown and the very first person that we meet is abby parks and they're doing they're having a dog show downtown and there was not there was not a business except for an old restaurant bar there was only one business open on main street mm. 
And I began talking to Abby Parks, and she basically, uh, before we ever moved here, we hadn't even bought, closed on the house. Uh, we signed up to join the Historical Society. She was the president of the Historical Society. We didn't even know what we were doing, and much less uh, we, we thought we were moving to Ackworth, but we weren't exactly sure. But we signed up. So the very first thing we did, we began to preserve this whole Macmillan house. We joined the Historical Society, and we meet Abby Parks, who has been really our conscience, our, our historical preservation conscience for uh, the city, and still is today. And she has a Macmillan house. She has a Macmillan house, and that's exactly right. So they're, the brothers, there were, there were actually four Macmillan brothers, and there were four houses at one point. Today, there's just three. So in some way, I guess Abby and I and Boyd and Carol were all related. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, no businesses in downtown Ackworth. Uh, uh, no. Nothing much happening except a dog show. No, there was a dog show, and uh, it wasn't even a very good dog show. Uh, and and uh, so we, we I, I can remember, th but, but you got to remember, we're thinking we'll buy the house, renovate it, sell it, mm -hmm. and move on. Mm -hmm. We never thought that we would, because at the time, uh, the population of Ackworth in 1997 was only about 10,000 people. There was nobody here. There was no businesses. We had about, we had about maybe 400 businesses. Mm -hmm. There was nothing here. So we really didn't think we were going to be here very long. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's the question. What happened? You know, we we get here, and we we begin to renovate the house, and we begin to meet people, and we begin to realize there's a real charm to this town. Kind of a an undiscovered charm, if you would. And there's a point at which, in my mind, I can remember, I was buying another, trying to buy another piece of property here. I was having trouble with the city leadership uh, changing the zoning on a piece of property. And it was very, very frustrating. I can remember kind of a conscious thing, thinking that, boy, if, if our property is ever going to be worth anything, uh, we've got to have a city government that is pro-business and understands the importance so of... So you were trying to change the zoning on your house? Yeah, no, not on our house. I was trying to buy a piece of property and oh, change another, the zoning. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And it was through this process that, which was a very difficult process, that I realized it, it kind of uh, dawned on me that if our property was ever going to be worth anything, we had to have other businesses that wanted to invest. Mm -hmm. And we had we as a government had to make it easy and inviting for businesses to come and invest. Mm -hmm. and, and we weren't doing that. Our, our city team at the time was not making it easy to invest. Was this staff or was it... Uh, combination of everything? Combination of everything. They didn't care? Are they just throwing uh, unreasonable roadblocks in the way? Um, there was a bad communication problem between city staff and elected. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and we had a couple of elected folks at the time that that was make, making it very difficult uh, to and and we're not communicating with city staff so there uh, um, but but we had some elected that 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 really understood the importance of being pro-business but we had some that didn't mm -hmm. um, and all of that's changed today we have a city staff and elected team that 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 gets it that understands mm -hmm. that you build quality of life mm -hmm. kind of from the inside out, and that you've got to have a culture that we've built here that understands the importance of building quality of life. That really put me on a trajectory of, uh, at the time, there was an election coming up, and I can remember going home one day and talking to Carolyn, and I said, you know, I'm just not sure that we've made a very good decision investing in this community because because we can't get the zoning, and, and things just, we need a different kind of culture mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you're the one that's always said, rather than being part of the problem and complaining, why don't you go do something about it? And at the, it was a, a, a time, an election, a post, a pre-election time where you have what's called a qualification period. Mm -hmm. And I walked into City Hall and I brought a check in and I signed up to run against a, a sitting, uh, an incumbent sitting uh, city council person. Uh, I didn't even know really that we did. Were there districts? Were there not districts? What it means to serve? Mm -hmm. at I didn't know anything. I just know that knew that we needed to have a change. The vote has the vote always been citywide. Yes. 
it, so even though you run in a particular district, everybody gets to vote? No, everybody serves at large, so there are no districts. Oh, but you, you have to say which post you're running for? You have to declare your post, but the post doesn't have any geographic boundaries. Right. Everybody serves at large. Everybody, everybody, every city councilman represents all the citizens right. in so the city. So how did you decide who you were going to run against? Well, um, I basically, um, at the time, the person that had given me such a hard time through the zoning mm. was the person that I ran against, okay. the very uncooperative person. And, mm. and, and I won, and she was no longer, uh, she no longer served. So I, I came on city council for two years. We were still had a communication problem uh, within the city uh, between our city elected team and city council and so then that's when I decided to run for mayor so I was on city council for two years I decided to run for mayor and uh, at the time then the sitting mayor decided she wasn't going to run and so I was elected um, at that point with no opposition I've served five terms since then with no opposition even the first time there was no opposition no <laughs> no well, that, I think a- everybody realized there was time for a change uh-huh. So I understand. That sounds like heaven to run without any opposition yeah. five times in a row. Okay, so uh, so uh, how do you go about um, creating the environment that you wanted in the city? You know, from the beginning, I could see that there was so much opportunity in the community, uh, and so I worked with. Uh, of, uh, our, one of our city planners, a fellow named Ron Huffman, we began to talk about um, we began to talk about planning, and we began to talk about quality of life. What was quality of life, and how do you build quality of life? And Ron helped me to kind of begin to put together um, what I would call um, uh, 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 an opportunity to design and build quality of life, and what. What Ron helped me to do is begin to realize how you measure quality of life. What what was it and how do you measure it? Because everybody, whether you're a business person or an individual looking to move your family to the city, everybody has a certain part of quality of life that they're looking for. They want to be in a safe community. That's a measurement. Mm-hmm. They want to have good schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to make sure that they're in a good location. Uh, they're... Uh, quality of life. They're looking for a diverse community, a loving, caring community that that is diverse, that embraces uh, diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they're looking for a community that uh, is a pro-business community that that wants to uh, make sure that they are welcoming uh, b- new business and helping new business. Mm-hmm. So you take those different parts of and, and each one of us that are moving into community, we're all looking for one of those quality of life for our family, and uh, so we began to, to really work on building a great quality of life. Our city council team understood the importance of building quality of life, and uh, and from quality of life, is that's how in the last uh, almost 20 years now, we've been the fastest growing city in Cobb County from a population standpoint and a business standpoint. You make it sound so easy that the city council believed in that, but you were talking about how just um, a year earlier, they were very d- divided. How, um, uh, how did you get everybody on the same page? It's really easy. Um, as as the as the personalities changed on the city council, they get, they were replaced with people that understood the vision of building great quality of life. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, we began to systematically change out the city staff. You can't change and build quality of life if everybody uh, has a different vision. So we had the vision to build quality of life. And then with, within the city council, where the core of our leadership is, the city council members uh, began to, to put this as a priority, and we made sure that our city staff, that we added people in our departments that understood quality of life. Like 
within our Parks and Recreation uh, program today. James Albright, a young man that has, has spent all of his adult life working uh, for our city and understands how important our Parks and Recreation are to building quality of life. See, we've, we've, got, we've got two lakes and four beaches. We have an extraordinary extraordinary mm -hmm. trail system and, and park system mm -hmm. that has 140 acres of dedicated green space in our downtown business district. There's mm -hmm. not another city in Georgia that has that. So that one component, our Parks and Recreation Department with the director, James Albright, mm -hmm. that, that, that prioritizes that, then has allowed uh, our city council to invest SPLOS dollars and make this investment in this program. That's one example. But having that kind of leadership, like the leadership at our police department with our police chief, Wayne Dennard, uh, that, that we systematically have, have created a police department that has worked on their number one priority is to build trust, mm -hmm. building trust. And that's why we have such a great police department and we have such a safe city. We're, we've been ranked since 2012 as being one of the safest cities in Georgia. Once again, putting the right people in place helps you to have a great opportunity like that. And I could go through every department. Every, every single department uh, has created a culture in their department that has extraordinary people delivering extraordinary services from our power department, our public works department, our finance department. I mean, without exception, uh, we have done a fabulous job because of the people that we've put in place. How long did it take to develop your vision for the city? Oh, I'd say probably to actively. Um, it 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 probably took two or three years to really begin to develop, but we're still. It's a journey. We're still building quality of life today. So, mm -hmm. as you know, a journey like like Henry Ford says, uh, a journey is a journey. It's not about getting to one place, a destination, mm -hmm. and saying, "Oh, we've arrived." Mm -hmm. We'll always be building quality of life. We'll always be looking to add people to our team that have a vision for great quality of life. I was just thinking, though, that a lot of people develop a vision and then set it over on the, on the desk and don't come back to it. No, I, I think one of the great things about our culture is the fact that we are vision-driven. We have this vision. We're purpose-driven to build this vision. And that we still today refer back to the vision. We actually created this vision through, um, through a workshop environment with our city staff and our elected officials in, in about 2005. And we still today go back and refer back to that meeting. And that's almost 15 years ago. Um, so we're still building that vision. Why don't we talk about some of the things like pro-business. Um, uh, uh, what did you do to attract businesses downtown? Well, I think that you go back to when you, when you change your culture with, when, as people change, then you have people in your community development uh, de team like Christine Dobbs that understands... Uh, and she's been with us almost 15 years, that understands uh, that, that business people are, are, make, are taking a risk when they open a business. Mm -hmm. And so if we can make it easy and we can help to facilitate, we get the B out of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You get the B out of bureaucracy. And then you are able to build uh, a business environment that makes it easy and, and that actually inspires and attracts people to want to invest in your community and you come along and really and truly as we've told so many developers and people down through the years we're going to be a partner and we we make a promise to our business owners to be their partner and to be the best partner that they're going to have because as you build quality of growth then you build this this great tax base mm -hmm. you balance your tax base and you build a sustainable tax base that you build to help deliver services out in the future for the next 5 or 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember when Henry Chandler comes into the story. Henry Chandler comes along in about 2001. He's been, he's, he's been there almost since the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
And you go back to Main Street, and I can remember when Henry made a commitment to uh, to 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 this. There's a little building right across the alleyway from uh, this mayor's office right here, and I can remember he was really that he created kind of the turning point in the whole redevelopment of our downtown. We had community members because Henry, in the beginning, taking a big risk operating on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. There were community members that came out and ha actually worked in the restaurant that helped him paint and do things. Now, it was his vision and his talent that that created the, the most successful restaurant that we've had uh, in our community. But uh, once again, we had a community members that came along, wanted him to be successful and helped him in the beginning. That was the catalyst on Main Street that actually began all the investment, I think, on Main Street. Yeah. And then what comes, uh, what are some of the others that come in? Well, I think after that, you know, then you had uh, you had uh, the Fusco's, Mike Fusco, Mike and David. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly see an opportunity as, as, as Henry becomes uh, very, very successful. And then kind of the business is up and down You that that you have. Uh, then Henry's business expands, and he comes up mm -hmm. and, and moves up to the corner here into a bigger space. Mm -hmm. uh, then Guy Condra comes. He buys the old uh, Smith building, the old hardware building there, and he comes and he invests. Uh, that's a 20,000-square-foot uh, building that he's got that he makes a substantial investment. Then all along the way, Pete Brumfield, uh, certainly uh, uh, somebody that had been on city council, that had been invested in the community, uh, he invested in some of his buildings there, and it was just like the domino effect. So that by the time we get to about uh, the mid 2000s, 2006, 7, and 8, you had some very successful businesses that were in downtown. What happened with the old mill? And at least it was saved, but. Uh, uh, and I know you were invested in it at one time. Why, why has that not um, been a success to this time? Well, the story, the preservation story, it's a journey. The preservation story about the old mill is um, as as we had people, it was the old shell of a building, and we had people uh, felt like it was a safety hazard. They wanted it tor torn down, and gosh, I just would look at the building and I would say that's such an iconic building uh, in our downtown. It's, it's built somewhere right around uh, the year 1867, 68 uh, by John Cowan. And um, so in 2005, I, had, I got a group of business people together uh, and we decided that we would preserve the building and that it would be a good place for a restaurant. Well, in the beginning, we could only get about 40 parking places there, but we, we operated uh, uh, the old mill in the beginning uh, as a successful restaurant for probably four years, four or five years. And then the Great Recession that happened 2008, 2009, as the world changed, uh, so did people's uh, buying habits temporarily. And there was a, a real shift, a real paradigm shift that was caused by the economy that really impacted uh, the old mill. And so we operated as long as until uh, about 2010, and um, and then we had the opportunity to we, we we closed it down because of economic reasons and 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 economic conditions in the economy. Then we sold it to a fellow named Dale Hughes that uh, did a good job with it for a couple of years. Um, then his and he since now has sold it to uh, uh, a, a group uh, Kevin Marcy the Georgia Funeral Care people, and they're going to transform the old mill into um, an event center, which I think is going to be a great transformation. Uh, they hope to have that open by the end of the summer. Uh, I think it'll be a really great use. So uh, as, 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 as journeys go, it begins mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as an old textile mill, and it has different, different seasons of life. And I, so we're coming into a season mm -hmm in which it'll be uh, an event center and it'll be a great use, yeah. a great use. An event center like weddings? And... Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, well, good. That's good. Uh, and um, uh, the, the growth of the population in the area, the, uh, as just driving down um, uh, Main Street today, coming here and going by uh, with Dogwood, uh, uh, what's it, Dogwood? Um... Well, it's the Holbrook. It's the Holbrook neighborhood. It's uh -huh. uh, there's there's a big neighborhood there that has 
uh, basically two parts. It has an assisted living component. Right. Then it also has independent living, which right. uh, the apartments and cottages, independent living, they're going to, um, once they get open, they'll probably be the home for about 300 new citizens in our city. Mm-hmm. And because of the demographic, uh-huh. because of the, the, the demographic of folks that are going to be living there, the age mm-hmm. group, and a lot of baby boomers, they're going to have um, uh, a spending impact of about $3 million a year into our community. So so for our downtown businesses and businesses are in our community, uh, uh, the Holbrook is going to have a really positive impact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you proudest of as mayor? You know, I think, um, I think our, our overall preservation of our community of we've had all this growth quality growth and but we've preserved something really important we've we've preserved our hometown feeling that hometown spirit where Mm -hmm. people call the police chief by his first name and they know the mayor and they call him tommy they have his 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 cell phone number and and we're still that loving caring community that people that grew up here remember as a child and I think if you ask anybody, we have a lot of folks right in our downtown area that have grown up here. And I think if you ask them about where we are today, they'll say that we've worked hard to make sure that we preserve that hometown spirit. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm really proud of that. I think the proudest moment might be uh, in 2010 as the city was chosen to be the All-America City and we were chosen to be the All-America City for, for many of the reasons that we've discussed here this morning. We, we were chosen because we had developed some important life-changing programs, life-changing programs for special needs children and for children at risk in our community that, uh, that we had uh, mentoring programs. And we were recognized as a city Mm-hmm. that had created life-changing programs that were programs that had actually changed people's lives. Mm-hmm. And that really, in 2010, uh, allows us to be awarded the All-America City mm-hmm. designation. Mm-hmm. So that was probably the proudest moment uh, that, I, that I've experienced. Mm-hmm. What kind of programs were they, the, the life-changing programs? Uh, the Horizon Field, as we built uh, the Horizon Field, uh, we raised uh, about a million and a half dollars, and then today we 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 manage and we operate um, and deliver a very great program for special needs children uh, in our community, all throughout our community. Uh, Lauren Ham is our uh, lady that is our director for our program and does a great job. She's she's we're the only city in Georgia that has what's called a special populations director. So she works with special needs children. Mm-hmm. And she works with uh, uh, our our adults that are 55 and older. We don't use the S word. We don't we don't mm-hmm. say the S word. We call them active adults. So um, uh, Lauren does a great job. But once again, we're back to people that mm-hmm. that create these programs. So so our Horizon Field program. Mm-hmm. Then we have um, uh, two mentoring programs that um, were designed to uh, to help children that are kind of at-risk children, and uh, they, they come to Robert's School every afternoon, and, mm-hmm. and uh, they're supervised, mm-hmm. and uh, they have a program where we actually help to, to facilitate uh, life skills with uh, young people that, that might have only one parent at home, mm-hmm. and it's been a very, very successful program. We have kids now that went through that program that went on to college and even some of them that even work for the city today that uh, have been involved with these programs for the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned diversity as one of the quality of life characteristics. Yes. Uh, certainly, I guess, um, special needs is one type of diversity, but how do you define diversity? Well, I think you, you define diversity um by just the way that you say diversity means, uh, and and I kind of have changed during the last couple of years. When I talk about diversity, I now use the word inclusiveness and making sure that we are inclusive to every part of our community. And that's not only color. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, could be, but that's eth- ethnicity today mm-hmm. because you have uh, uh, different parts of the population and you have your African-American part of the population, but we have a, a very uh, big la- la- Latino part of mm-hmm. our population, Asian part of our population. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we are looking to be inclusive, making sure that we have something for everyone. As people have moved into this community, and that comes, uh, they are looking for how do they plug into the community? How do they be a part? Mm-hmm. And that comes through our church partnerships. Mm-hmm. Uh, we recently had a, a church, I'll give you a great example. We re- recently had a church plant that came from Miami, Florida called Greater Church. And Chino Echeverria was the pastor, and he comes and he sits down. And he says, Tommy, we're looking to, to provide a church environment for people that there's a gap in the community for uh, for uh, uh, Latino peoples that could come and worship, and we know there's a gap, and so we're going to provide a church that that and be a partner with the city, and that's exactly what they've done. Mm-hmm. So we have been blessed with all these partnerships that help to support our desire, our heart's desire to be diverse Mm -hmm. and be inclusive. That's just one little example. The Horizon Field is another example of making sure that we don't leave any part of our population behind. Mm -hmm. And we've done a great job, I think, in preserving our African-American heritage as we took Roberts School Community Center, was one of three schools built in the 1950s, and we took this school and invested over a million dollars of community development block grant money to preserve this school. It was w- one of three segregated schools that was built in the late 1950s. We had one right here in the community. We've preserved that. That's part of our African American heritage today, and we use it today as a community center. And we we are proud of the fact that we have preserved our African American heritage. All along the way, our quality of life has been a series of preservation efforts that touch not only physical buildings, but but touch cultures, the different cultural parts of our community. Talk about the art center. That, uh, it's another great example of preserving African American heritage. Uh, that was the old McConnell House. It was actually uh, it the the McConnell House, the art house, sits right at the corner of Logan Farm Park. And Logan Farm Park is a brand new, our newest park. It was built out of a swampland from Tanyard Creek. And we, pres- we preserved the swampland, turned it into a viable park, and we preserved right on the corner is the art house. It's the McConnell House, African-American heritage home. But it was the very first business, African-American business in our community. They operated a shoe shop, the McConnells did, out of the basement of that house. And so if you go around there and you open up the door to the basement, you can go in and see in the basement of the art house there, you can see where the very first African-American business was, uh, uh, a cobbler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the art house, uh, what kinds of programs are taking place in there now? Well, the art house is a 501... um, it's a 501 uh, uh, C3, and it is um, uh, a nonprofit that has whose mission is dedicated to promoting art, mm-hmm. but also uh, making sure that we uh, create uh, art education in our community. Mm-hmm. And we've got about 65 different artists that are members there. And almost every day, without exception, there is a workshop of some kind going on there at the work at the art house in the morning. Mm-hmm. But another thing that the art uh, that the board of directors has done with the art house, and uh, we've been really blessed to have uh, great leadership there. Uh, and and um, as we began our mission with the art house, mm-hmm. we began with the mission to to promote art education. And um, this past year, uh, we've actually given scholarships to to young people, to children in high school, but also scholarships so that we have created a summertime workshops for children through art scholarships to be able to come and have an opportunity to uh, to advance and to learn more yeah. about art. Yeah. Of course, you've got the Rosenwald School across the street. Right across the too, street, yeah. Another great example of a preservation effort, um, uh, the Rosen, Julius Rosenwald had built about 2,000 of these uh, educational 
uh, schools uh, in communities all around America during between about 1910 and 1925. He builds 2,000 of these Rosenwald, they were called the Rosenwald schools. They were built in African American neighborhoods specifically to deliver education to the African American communities that didn't have education opportunities. Today, out of those 2,000 uh, schools, there's only 200, about 200 of them left. We have one right across from Logan Farm Park that uh, was preserved. Abbey Park's got a, uh, originally uh, secured a grant from Lowe's, and then the city came along and worked together to help preserve that, and now today uh, it is a city-managed uh, uh, location, and we actually do all of the... Um, all of the maintenance there, and I we was operate. I just thinking about the connection. You work for Lowe's, and Lowe's. That's right. Lowe's comes back and invests in this community. Uh, so once again, the the builder in me uh, that started at Lowe's still has important uh, ties with the Lowe's company. We've uh, talked on off and on about historic preservation, but why don't you talk about the Carrie Dyer House and your role with that? Well, once again, you know, as part of as, as part of me and my um, lifelong career to be a builder, and metaphorically, the builder uh, builds buildings, but he also builds organizations and wants to help build communities. Mm -hmm. But there's something that has always been inherent in, in, in the builder in me, and that is wanting to make sure that, that we would save things that other people didn't want to save, like the old mill, like the Macmillan house, uh, and so the Kerry Dyer House was one of the oldest homes in the city and um, was built in the late 1850s. Uh, and it was right down the street here from City Hall. The home had fallen in disrepair and a builder had bought it and was gonna tear it down. And I, I met with him and of course, it's not in a historic district, so he could have torn it down. And I, I met with him and I called him in and I said, look, please don't tear down the Kerry Dyer House. Uh, renovate it. So he, he comes up with a renovation idea that, that totally distorted mm -hmm. the original character of the home. And um, after a lot of forceful persuasion, I, just, I uh, actually talk him into selling me the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of those things, sometimes no good deed goes unpunished. And so it was a very extensive, very complicated renovation because you had to build new onto the back and uh, the house was in very bad disrepair. Mm -hmm. But we renovated it, preserved it, and added on to it. And now we've just sold it and brought uh, a new couple uh, from Woodstock and they've just moved into our downtown. And so mission accomplished. And uh, <clears throat> another preservation, uh, an important preservation project completed and added to uh, to our community. Let's talk about uh, the the money that's been spent for uh, improvements in the downtown area and uh, spost money and uh, um, it, it it must have taken a lot of cooperation. I, I guess part of the Parklands Corps of Engineer land too, isn't it? Oh, it is. Where, um, where you're talking about uh, Ten Yard Creek flood area. So you had to work with federal government, uh, state, Cobb County. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit, about how you went about uh, bringing about the improvements in the downtown area? Well, I think, um, I think when, you, when, you, when you look around our city, and I, I talked a few minutes ago, you know, we have, we have two lakes and four beaches, mm -hmm. and we have a convergence of walking trails that, that kind of connect our community. Uh, and all around that is Corps of Engineer property. And we've, we've got this tremendous, awesome partnership with, uh, with the Corps of Engineers. We philosophically understand what they want. We have people on our city team that work so well and have allowed us to be able to, to access the Corps of Engineer property and build around it, not necessarily build on it, but build around it and be able to pass through the Corps of Engineer property to give our citizens some really great resources. So um, primarily the way we've paid for a lot of what you see has been through SPLOS. Since 1994, there's been four, uh, five different SPLOS cycles. And with 
with the county uh, being a partner and with their part of SPLOS that they've uh, allocated to us and our part of SPLOS that our citizens have voted to allow us to use, we've invested about $150 million in our community. Mm -hmm. And um, we have uh, just extraordinary uh, resources, and that's through parklands, through parks, uh, road projects, um, uh, walking trails, all of the, the – we, we call these quality of life projects. And, um, and once again, uh, it, it comes from partnerships with the county and partnerships with the Corps of Engineers to be able to have these kinds of investments. Mm -hmm. um, we talked before the interview started about best-kept secrets, and you wanted to talk a little bit about um, maybe your philosophy of – of, uh, governance and and life in general. Well, I think I think you know you, you, we we were talking about best kept secret a secret that I would have that probably nobody really knows about me uh, or or that I don't I wouldn't necessarily because I haven't talked about it publicly. I'm always talking about things about the city, but me personally, uh, when I think about kind of. Uh, uh, my personal mission in life, and it really boils down to making sure that that um, that I make my life count. And mm -hmm. as a result of being the mayor here for almost 20 years, um, it has it it has allowed me to travel down a journey, a path, with a lot of different experiences that have happened. But at the same time. I've been able to see how important leadership is. And leadership, uh, we define leadership with influence. And so I think for me, kind of as, as the journey, as I'm somewhere toward the end of my journey, uh, I realize and have realized how important it is that I make sure that, that, that I make it count, that every, every day of my life that I leave people better than when I found them, that I show God's love, and that I be willing to take on things that nobody else wants to do, like uh, the old mill and the Kerry Dyer House, to, mm -hmm. to, to leave the community better than when I found them. So that's not something that, that not just everybody is going to know about me, because I don't talk a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Well, that may be a good way to bring the interview to a close, unless you want to add anything else. No, I really, uh, Dr. Scott, have enjoyed being with you, as I always do. Uh, and you have certainly had uh, a real impact uh, on me and this community, and I, I thank you for being a great partner. Thank you.